Today we will be going over the worst contestants from MasterChef Season 1. And this contestant right here had a pleasing personality, but when it comes to cooking, she was an absolute fail. With her warm heart and contagious energy, Avis infused the show with life. Her humorous remarks and affectionate hugs for both judges and contestants added a touch of warmth to the competition. Always quick to share a smile or laugh, she endeared herself to many. Her presence on the show was a breath of fresh air, and her ability to uplift those around her made her a beloved figure among viewers and participants alike. Whatever my hands touch, will win me this competition. Avis struggled with cooking despite her dishes being flavorful. Her old-fashioned cooking style and presentation didn't meet the modern standards expected in the competition. Her method seemed outdated, which didn't help her in the contest. Her biggest challenge was her limited knowledge of Chinese cuisine, which held her back. Despite her excitement, Avis struggled to master key techniques and ingredients, which led to her elimination. In a competition where understanding various cuisines is vital, her limited experience with Chinese cooking was a major disadvantage. Avis introduced herself as a caregiver from Louisiana who excelled in Cajun cuisine. She claimed her dish, Catfish Arcadia with angel hair pasta, would be so tasty it would make your tongue slap your brain out. And so she wild promise, right? However, when the judges tasted her dish, it didn't live up to expectations, which ultimately contributed to her downfall in the competition. When you put food on a plate that old-fashioned, it really does let that dish down. Graham was impressed by Avis's passion and energy. He liked her enthusiasm, but felt the pasta was a bit too heavy. He was mostly positive, though he suggested that her presentation could be a bit more polished. I think that the pasta's a little heavy. Definitely room for improvement on that. Joe, however, stayed quiet and didn't say much. His face showed no emotion. Ram's he was more upfront, pointing out that the pasta was overcooked but complimenting the catfish for being cooked perfectly. Graham was open to giving Avis a chance, but Joe wasn't interested. Then Ramsey, known for his tough but caring approach, had a quick conversation with Avis. She pleaded for an opportunity, and Ramsey, possibly touched by her determination, decided to let her wear a white apron. Her joy was clear, and you could hear her cheering as she ran back to the audition area. Put that on. <laughs> By episode 3, Avis was still holding on in the competition. She made boiled eggs wrapped in lettuce, a dish that looked more old-fashioned than groundbreaking. The judges criticized her for the dish's outdated presentation, but despite this, she survived boot camp and celebrated enthusiastically. Although Avis had a lot of passion, her time on the show was full of ups and downs, with mixed feedback from the judges. Later, she attempted a modern bread pudding with chocolate, which she was really excited about. She explained to Ramsey that she was making a special sauce to drizzle on top. Ramsey advised her to keep the pudding moist, but even with her excitement, Avis's dish didn't make it into the top three, hinting at the struggles she would face ahead. From the start, the judges weren't impressed with Avis's cooking style. They felt it was outdated and didn't meet the high standards of MasterChef. During the elimination test, Avis had a hard time. She was tasked with creating a mandarin orange Chinese dish, a cuisine she wasn't familiar with. Her attempt at a modern twist on Chinese orange chicken with veggies and noodles fell flat with the judges. Ramsey compared her dish to something you'd find at a gas station, which left Avis feeling defeated. She knew she was in trouble. When the bottom three were announced, Avis was the third to be called, following Farouk and Sheena. Her lack of knowledge in Chinese cuisine and the messy execution of her dish led to her elimination. I'm sorry, my darling. Your time is done inside MasterChef. Avis was briefly featured in a montage on the show, but despite being sent home early, she remained hopeful and believed her dream was still alive. By episode 13, she returned with other eliminated contestants for the finale, enthusiastically cheering on Whitney, her fellow Mississippian. Though her time on the show was short, Avis stayed supportive and optimistic. After MasterChef, Avis aimed to establish herself by opening Abby's Restaurant in August 2016, located in the Quality Inn Hotel in Laplace. Initially, 
the restaurant received positive reviews, but it closed in 2017. Avis attempted to remain in the public eye through local cooking demos, but couldn't escape her MasterChef reputation. Avis's journey on MasterChef was a rough ride from the start. Not only was she part of the very first double elimination, getting sent home along with Sheena, but she also had the unfortunate distinction of being the first contestant to have their entire audition aired before being eliminated right away. Despite her high spirits, Avis couldn't win over the judges. Her orange chicken, featured in episode 4, was a big disappointment, landing her in the bottom three and ultimately leading to her exit from the show. But Avis didn't let this setback define her. Instead of giving up, she channeled her passion into something new. In August 2016, she opened Avi's restaurant inside the Quality Inn Hotel in Laplace. The restaurant quickly became known for its great reviews, proving that Avis's cooking had a place outside of the TV spotlight. Although the restaurant closed in 2017, Avis remained active in the culinary world. She continued to inspire others with her cooking through demonstrations at local events, showing that even though MasterChef wasn't her stage, she still had a lot to offer the food community. But here comes another contestant who made a lot of splash, but for all the wrong reasons. At just two as one of the youngest contestants that season, she made a big splash right from the start, wowing the judges with her Vietnamese cooking during the Egg Boot Camp Challenge. Her skills and execution were perfect, setting the bar high from the get-go. Whitney, unfortunately, you're out. I was like, yeah. <laughs> In the Chinese invention test, Slim impressed everyone with her creative chicken dish that had mandarin oranges. Although she forgot to add the stock, which caught Gordon's attention, her effort was still commendable. Early on, she showed a lot of promise, but things started to go downhill for Slim when she had to cook non-Asian dishes. She wasn't very familiar with other types of cuisine, and it became a real struggle for her. As the competition grew tougher, she found it harder to keep up. Instead of using the judges' feedback to improve, Slim seemed to shut down and stop listening. Her inability to adapt and learn from her mistakes led to her downfall, making her journey in the competition much more challenging. It's a TV dinner, stir-fry with bits of chicken that the dog didn't want to eat. Her stubbornness and refusal to adapt were her undoing. In her final challenge, she had to make a dish with passion fruit, but it was a disaster. The dish didn't come together well and didn't impress the judges. Although she showed great promise early on, her narrow culinary skills and disregard for feedback caused her downfall. It was a classic story of starting off strong, but failing to evolve and meet the competition's needs. In the end, her inability to grow and adapt led to her being eliminated. This dish, an injustice. I saw a Reddit post about Slim Hoon that really disturbed me. Someone said they had to skip through a video because it showed Huyn being cruel to an innocent animal. The commenter was deeply upset by this, and it brought back a painful memory. They recalled a time when they were on a sightseeing boat, and the guide, trying to impress everyone, caught a lobster and ripped off its tail right in front of them to cook it. The whole experience was shocking and upsetting for them. As he did this, some row spilled out, and the front part of the lobster lobster kept squirming. It was a pretty gruesome scene. To make it even worse, the guy just tossed the lobster's front half back into the ocean as if it was nothing. In Florida, it's against the law to catch female lobsters, so not only was this scene cruel, but it was also illegal. The commenter was really disgusted by what happened, and it's easy to understand why. Another user slammed Slim Hung for being cruel with how she deals with live seafood. They claim that the most humane way is to quickly boil the crabs, saying it's the fastest and least painful method. Just stop for two seconds. That needs to be cooked, otherwise it would be flavorless. You'll have a dry crab. Slim didn't go by the usual method. Instead, she ripped the crabs apart with her bare hands. The user thinks this is cruel and makes the crabs suffer before they die. The crab's live. Yes, sir. Right, so you're torturing it now. They were upset by how Slim Hun treated animals and showed no real remorse or understanding of the cruelty involved. 
they found her behavior off-putting, describing her as rude and entitled. Her cooking style felt repetitive and overly reliant on her ethnic background, making it seem one-dimensional. The user was particularly disturbed by Slim's harsh cooking methods and her unappealing attitude. This critique paints a clear picture of someone who not only mishandles seafood, but also lacks respect and creativity in their approach to cooking. Overall, the combination of Slim's brutal cooking techniques and unpleasant personality made her difficult to watch, leading to strong feelings of disappointment and disapproval toward her. It's horrible. That's difficult for me to be like, oh, hi, honey. Like Whitney, she was the youngest chef of the season at just 22. Her energy and youth seemed promising at first, but her time in the kitchen took a dramatic turn for the worse. Sure, she could whip up an impressive Asian dish, but when asked to venture beyond her comfort zone, things quickly went south. And I mean that quite literally. Just look at her infamous passion fruit fondue, for example. It was a disaster that no one could forget. Instead of being a hit, it turned out to be a messy flop, showing that while she had potential, she struggled when faced with new challenges. It was supposed to impress the judges, but instead, it was the first dish to be thrown into the dreaded Joe trash bin. And I mean that quite literally. It was a complete disaster, an epic fail, really. The judges' expressions said it all. The dish was a total flop. Her downfall happened in the final episode, during the plate romance challenge. While most chefs would have opted for a touch of romance, like a heart-shaped garnish, she took it way too literally. Instead of something subtle, she made a fondue-style dish designed for two people to share. It was a bold move, but it didn't pay off. The judges were clearly unimpressed, and her dish didn't make the cut. The attempt to mix romance with cooking ended up being a big letdown, and it was clear from the looks on the judges' faces that this dish was not what they were hoping for. Telling you about what we're producing because this is ridiculous. It was supposed to be romantic, but it ended up looking more like a gooey mess. In the end, her downfall came from focusing too much on just one thing and not thinking creatively. Chef Ramsay called her a one-hit wonder in her final episode, and it's clear why. She began with a great dish in the first elimination challenge, coming in second to Mike. However, after that initial success, she struggled and didn't stand out in any of the mystery box challenges. Her inability to adapt and bring new ideas to the table ultimately led to her being eliminated. That's why my sauce was starting to separate because I forgot to strain it. <laughs> Kat Cora's halibut dish was a complete disaster. She only managed to stay in the competition that week because Farouk made an even bigger mess. Her final week was a total train wreck. She attempted a fruit fondue dish, but it failed miserably. When she ended up in the bottom two with Whitney, Chef Ramsay gave her a chance to explain what she would do differently. Her response? She said she would make the same dish again, but use less ginger. This answer showed she didn't really grasp how to fix her mistakes. The judges could see that she lacked the understanding needed to improve her cooking. As a result, she was sent home shortly after. In summary, while she had a brief shining moment, she couldn't keep it up. Her poor performance in the challenges and her inability to recognize her mistakes made her one of the weakest contestants in the competition. Slim's time on the show was thrilling and full of learning, but her journey ended in episode 8. Her passion fruit fondue, while daring, didn't quite succeed, leading to her elimination. But Slim didn't let this stop her. After leaving MasterChef, she went back to college, determined to complete her degree and set herself up for the future. Juggling her studies with her love for cooking, she took a part-time job at a local restaurant. This opportunity not only helped her sharpen her cooking skills, but also gave her a chance to earn some extra money. Even though her time on the show ended, Slim's passion and drive continued to push her forward, making sure she stayed on the path to achieving her dreams. Now, this next contestant actually made it to finals, but he had his fair share of setbacks. David Miller, 
David was a standout contestant on MasterChef USA, but not in a way that everyone admired. From the very beginning, he was known for his eccentric personality and a level of arrogance that made him hard to miss. Watching him was like riding an emotional roller coaster. His dramatic breakdowns and tears were as frequent as his intense confrontations. <laughs> Despite his raw talent and cooking skills, his behavior often overshadowed his abilities. David had a knack for taking charge. He loved stepping into the role of leader during team challenges, even if it meant stepping on a few toes. Monterey Jack too. Uh -huh. So we're sitting down, we're planning out, and it actually seems to be working. His hot temper was a common sight especially when things weren't going his way. Whether it was losing a challenge or receiving criticism from the judges, David's reactions were intense and sometimes cringeworthy. I was hoping it was better. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe I misheard you. His fiery outbursts were a part of his emotional cooking journey that captivated and repelled viewers in equal measure. One of the most memorable aspects of David's time on MasterChef was his participation in the very first finals of the show where two different genders faced off. His presence was marked by his status as the first runner-up and the first male runner-up, which was no small feat. We might be disorganized when we make a hell of a burger, come on! What set him apart was his unique achievement of never being in the bottom of any challenge throughout the competition. This rare accomplishment highlighted his consistency, but his charm was far from winning over everyone. After his stint on MasterChef, David's life took a personal turn. He got married in Vegas and welcomed a son, a new chapter that seemed to balance out his earlier dramatic public persona. Despite returning to his original career in software, David didn't completely let go of his cooking passion. He continued to share his culinary creations on social media, a testament to his enduring love for the kitchen. However, not all of David's post-MasterChef endeavors were as positive. He faced controversy when he was banned from Ear I Ear Mech Market, a Reddit community for mechanical keyboard enthusiasts. The ban was due to accusations of scamming users a serious blow that tarnished his reputation in another area of interest. David's time on MasterChef was a complex blend of remarkable talent and a polarizing personality. His skills in the kitchen earned him a place in the finals, but his volatile behavior often left a sour taste. Final four. It's the make it or break it. It's the end all or be all. While he proved himself as a fierce competitor and a talented cook, his journey was marked by moments of intense drama and public scrutiny. Moving on, teared the competition with a heavy heart, driven by personal emotions as she cooked in honor of her family. She started off strong, impressing the judges with her signature dish, smothered chicken, which earned her three yes votes right away. This early success made her seem like a serious contender in the competition. Tracy's skills in southern comfort food and desserts were evident, as she was the only one to showcase a dessert during the egg boot camp challenge. She even showed Lyle Towed versatility by excelling in the Chinese Mandarin Orange Invention Test, which impressed the judges further. I just yelled like a crazy woman. However, things took a turn for the worse as the competition went on. Despite her initial promise, Tracy's performance began to decline. Her struggles were most apparent during the Cupcake Mystery Box Challenge. When her cupcake fell apart, she broke down in tears, clearly overwhelmed and unable to handle the pressure. It was a tough moment for her, and it made it clear that she was having a hard time keeping up with the demanding competition. The vegetables are cooked with care, and they taste delicious. Good job. Tracy's downfall became even more evident as the competition progressed. She was sent home in a double elimination alongside Jake after failing to impress the judges with her ravioli. Her inability to recover from her earlier mistakes and deliver consistently good dishes was a major factor in her elimination. Throughout the competition, Tracy was vocal about her pride in her Southern heritage. She expressed her hopes that Whitney, another contestant, would win and bring the title home for the South. I wanna bake something. Baking is what I do. While her passion for her roots was admirable, it wasn't enough to save her from the challenges of the competition. I just started to crumble. After leaving the MasterChef kitchen, Tracy decided to return to her previous career in medicine. She is now an urgent care physician in pediatrics at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Additionally, 
She works as a consultant for DirectMed Healthcare Solutions. It seems that the kitchen was not her true calling, and she found her way back to a field where she could use her skills more effectively. But here comes a contestant who is remembered for his infectious energy and constant enthusiasm. Though he was lively and engaging, his time on the show was marked by a series of missteps that ultimately led to his downfall. Mike, well done. You see, from the get-go, Mike was seen as a standout contestant. He was the first to win a coveted white apron in the American Asterisk MasterChef Asterisk, a notable achievement that made him an early favorite. His chipper personality and upbeat attitude set him apart from others. In the early rounds, Mike did quite well. He won the first invention test, impressing both the judges and the audience. He also earned the distinction of being the first team captain to win in the series, which further solidified his status as a front runner. No safety net. You're playing without a net now. You went all in. All in, yeah. However, Mike's promising start quickly began to unravel. Despite his initial successes, his performance became increasingly erratic. During the Cat Cora replication challenge, things started to go south. His dishes fell short of the mark, and he landed on the bottom, a stark contrast to his early victories. This was just the beginning of a series of unfortunate events for Mike. But I don't even want to eat it. I'm sorry. The nail in the coffin came during a crucial elimination round. Mike infamously served a trifle that contained raw egg whites, a blunder that did not sit well with the judges, particularly Joe Bastianich. The mistake was significant enough to send him packing, marking a dramatic end to his time on the show. It was clear that his enthusiasm and positive attitude were not enough to compensate for his glaring mistakes in the kitchen. After his asterisk MasterChef asterisk appearance, Mike attempted to stay in the culinary spotlight by opening a pop-up restaurant called R&D Table with a friend. Unfortunately, the restaurant closed in 2011. Although the reviews before its closure were decent, it was evident that Mike's culinary ventures were not enough to sustain a long-term business. He then worked in various restaurants in Los Angeles, including the Bazaar at the SLS Hotel. Despite these experiences, Mike struggled to make a lasting impact in the competitive culinary world. Today, Mike serves as the executive chef for an events company called Plan on Q. While he has continued to work in the food industry, his career has not reached the heights many expected after his initial asterisk, MasterChef asterisk appearance. His journey from a bright-eyed contestant to a chef struggling to maintain his footing highlights the harsh reality of the culinary world, where enthusiasm and energy alone are not always enough to guarantee success. Though he started strong and captured the audience's attention with his upbeat attitude, his inconsistent performance and critical mistakes ultimately overshadowed his early achievements. His subsequent career attempts have been neat here a mix of fleeting successes and challenges, demonstrating that the path to culinary fame is not always straightforward or guaranteed, which reminds me of a certain time when things got downright wild in episode 4, and it was all thanks to Jenna's antics. This episode was all about diving deep into the flavors of China, and the spotlight was on Whitney, the mystery box winner. As the victor, she got the power to choose the main ingredient for the other chefs to work with. The options? Chinese mushrooms, oranges, or duck. And what did Whitney pick? Mandarin oranges. Yep, mandarin oranges. Let's just say, not everyone was thrilled about that choice. The tension in the kitchen was palpable. Get the tidings ball, baby, come on. And can you blame them? Mastering Chinese cuisine isn't something you can just do on a whim, especially not in an hour. Even Ramsay himself had a hard time mastering Chinese dim sum from the pros on his other show. Asterisk, the F word asterisk. Seriously, let me know if you want me to dive into that show sometime. Anyway, back to Jenna. Now what's going on? Uh, Asian orange stir-fry. Sure, orange stir-fry sounds decent, right? But could she actually pull it off? Orange chicken with the snap peas with the orange infused rice. Jenna presented her dish, orange stir-fry. Like, okay, orange chicken, we get it. But there was a big issue here. You place it up with 20 minutes to go. Right. Food dies as it sits in the window. Her dish had been sitting out for a whole 20 minutes before she brought it up. Ramsey was crossing his fingers, hoping it hadn't dried out, or worse, 
gone cold. That had better taste phenomenal to put it up with 20 minutes to go. Then Joe stepped in to taste what Jenna dared to put on the plate. You can probably guess where this is going. This is the problem. Talk about poking the bear, Jenna. After tasting Jenna's dish, Joe didn't hold back. He looked over at the other contestants and dropped a truth bomb, warning them all. It's not the spirit of what we came here to do. If you want to play the game and be safe, you're not going to win this thing. Joe was not impressed with Jenna's dish at all. He even went so far as to call it boring. It's boring. It's, it's, it's... I was expecting something more fiery, you know? Where's the flair, Joe? But honestly, Joe's frustration was totally justified. You can't just throw any dish together and expect to win big. Joe's reaction was a real wake-up call for everyone. The other judges didn't even bother trying it. Then Joe hit the contestants with a crucial reminder. We're trying to find the best chef in America. Who's here to do that? The judges were done with the kid gloves, and they weren't about to start handling them gently again. Bring it 100%, and if you're not, you should probably just leave your apron and you check yourself out right now. He really laid it all out there, didn't he? And Jenna? She was just standing there, probably rethinking every decision she made that day. Joe's harsh critique definitely made her question her cooking skills. But hey, that's just Joe being Joe. This might have been one of the first times Joe completely dismissed a dish, but it certainly wouldn't be the last. Everything you see on the show is fake. It's not just about the food. Even their outfits are predetermined. Ever noticed how each contestant seems to have an endless supply of the same type of clothing? It's not like they have a wardrobe full of identical outfits at home. Or maybe they do. Who knows? But spoiler alert, they don't have to carry their clothes along when they sign up for the show. The producers are the masterminds behind those looks, crafting each contestant's style to fit a specific character type. Welcome, guys. Turns out, it's all masterminded by the costume department. Yep, each contestant gets a wardrobe that's supposed to fit their personality, and they're told exactly what to wear for each episode. Take Tommy from season six, for example. Yeah, you, you look, <laughs> thank you, thank you, you look like Prince. Prince looks like me. His outfits, though formal, had that touch of funk to it, just to match his upbeat personality. Yeah, the wardrobe and makeup crew are busy crafting a specific character and storyline for each contestant. They do it so smoothly that you probably don't even notice. Like you probably didn't notice Courtney's attire from season 5. Or maybe you did? I mean, it's hard to miss seeing someone in literal heels, right? In fact, Elise Mayfield, a contestant from season 5, explained to AV Club that they would all be dolled up in a chosen outfit. Once to dressed, it was off to the works. Wardrobe, hair, and makeup. Police, how are you feeling? <laughs> but here comes the most concerning part. MasterChef has a way of boxing contestants into narrow roles, almost turning them into cartoon versions of themselves. It's like the show strips away their humanity, similar to what you see in a lot of reality TV. But hey, that's just my opinion. And with that, we've come to the end of today's list. But who do you think was the worst contestant of MasterChef Season 1? How would you rank them and why? Don't forget to let me know in the comments below. And before you head out, if you thought the video was crazy, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notification. And hey, don't forget to check out this next video right here. It's even crazier.